So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to have a quick look at BMY, Bristol Myers Squibb. Somebody's been asking a little bit about that. And it's also one that we actually do have a small position in, in our family portfolio, a small position. It's been in there for a while. It's not one that I've added to in a while. But after this video, I'll let you know my thoughts. Stay tuned to the end of the video because we go in depth into this company. We look at some of the opportunities here. We look at the potential for some very strong returns, but I also cover off what I believe are going to be those key risks that you will face if you're looking to make an investment in this company today. So stick around to the end, learn what to watch for, learn what the opportunities are, and learn what I think about this company. Stick with me, we'll get into it. So this bar chart here is showing the top pharmaceutical companies based on their research and development spending levels in 2022. Now, obviously, to some degree, this is going to be correlated to the size of the company. Larger companies tend to be spending more. But at the same time, there's also the opportunity for firms to strategically invest in research and development in a way that's going to refresh their pipeline also. Now, if you look down here, we can see the, the names that we're probably familiar with near the top. With the Bristol Myers Squibb BMY coming in as one of the, I guess, one of the larger seven or eight players here as well. And then after that, there's a bit of a drop off before we see the, the spending by, RD spending by Eli Lilly coming through. Now, the, the significant research and development spend here is also important because as these drugs come off patent, you get what they call a patent cluck. And we see the very, very strong revenue and very, very strong profitability that is driven by legally protected drugs that are protected by patents. That all comes to a close and it can come crashing down very fast and very hard at the end of the period that it's covered and protected by the patent. As a result, these firms are spending huge sums of money in research and development to both discover new drugs as well as shepherd them through the pipeline as well through various levels of testing and trials to ensure efficacy, to ensure that they do not have any unwanted side effects. And by doing this, they continually replenish that pipeline. And here, as we see with Bristol Myers Squibb, we can see they're in a very good position here, competitively compared to the peers. Now, it's also important to get an understanding of how firm and steady that research and development spending is. So here I've turned to fast graphs and I'm having a look at some of the fundamental data. I've plotted in green here the free cash flow essentially and then in black the common dividends being paid out and we can see here per share the free cash flow is substantially higher than the common dividends which is always a good thing to see. Now as I have a look at a few other metrics as well we can begin to, to assess whether or not this is a, a good opportunity. Now what I've done in this screen is I, again on BMY I am looking at the cash and short term investments total current assets as well as the total assets. Now I'm just going to quickly scroll through these and I just want to, to sort of get a sense for how they're moving and, and whether or not this is looking as though we're doing a, we're seeing what we want to see. So we can see looking at the trend here in terms of the short term investments they have got a reasonably strong trend there in terms of total current assets again generally that is trending upwards and I'm liking the look at that in total assets post pandemic they've still got quite a, a strong total asset base with a little bit of a downwards trend there now the other thing I want to do as well is begin to look at some of the short term debt and we can see that short term debt has been increasing there Total current liabilities has been increasing quite strongly. Now you'll see that it seems to be a much stronger and clearer trend than we saw with the assets. Now that's interesting to see. The long-term debt, similarly to the assets, jumped with COVID and is now busy declining. And when we begin to look at this then, the, the total liabilities for the company jumped during COVID and is now beginning to decline a little bit as well. Total equity follows the same type of pattern. One of the last elements here that I want to look at is looking at in red here the sales of revenue per share which we have seen increasing fairly strongly and steadily over the last eight or so years as well as the net income per share as well which has taken a bit of a tumble post COVID but seems to have been equalizing at a, a relatively strong point there. Just looking also at some key ratios here liquidity is important so I'm going to take off these one by one and we'll go through them the current ratio is above one which is always good to see so that's encouraging though we can see it beginning to to dive down a little bit towards one now driven as we saw in previous views with that thing so i think in the debt 
quick ratio follows very much the same pattern. The longer term debt to capital has been increasing through COVID. It uh, looks like it's leveled up a bit. And it'll be interesting to see how that changes in the next couple of years. And the long term debt to equity again has been increasing quite a bit as well with the COVID blast up above one. So slightly higher than what I'd want to see. Now, the return on assets has been relatively strong and consistent, again, with the COVID dip there. The net margin has also been fairly strong, above 10 times, with, again, again those COVID dips being quite challenging to, to manage. So what has been going on here? We've seen since the pandemic that Bristol Myers Squibb has not grown particularly strongly. It's had a little bit of an up, a bit of a down, a bit of an up, and now a little bit of a decline again. Now, the price to earnings ratio is currently sitting well into the single digits, so which is in contrast to how, where it was sitting in 2010 at 30 times. Well, I certainly wouldn't be paying 31 times on a price to earnings ratio. I'm much more interested in it at this level at about eight times. But the market is looking at Bristol Myers Squibb, and one of the key things that it will be looking at is some of these major drugs that Bristol Myers Squibb has. Now, for example, the chemotherapy drug Revlimid and Eliquis, they, they basically have generated about $21 billion in sales in the 2022 financial year. Now, Revlimid lost European Union patent protection last year, and it's going to lose its U.S. patent protection just off the edge of this graph in 2026. And what that means is it means that rather than sort of, you know, billions and billions of sales, it means by 2028, analysts are actually expecting the sales of these drugs to fall down to a very, very small, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars rather than, say, $10 billion when they've got that patent protection. So we're talking about some substantial changes in the revenue from these leading drugs. No. Eliquis had its protections in the US extended to 2026, and by 2028, it's also expected to see a very significant sales decline as well. Now, when we think about what this means, there's a couple of really important points there. So we've got these big sales cliffs coming up where the patents are going to come off. We've got Revlimid, we've got Eliquis, we've got Opdivo as well. And now I add all these together, in 2022, they were roughly two-thirds of sales, and the protection for these products are going to be, all be gone by 2028. Now, you say 2028, Lincoln, that is a long way into the future. It's only five years. Now, this is a company and pharmaceutical companies you should be able to hold for quite a while. And that's going to be what a lot of the stock market and Mr. Market is looking at, with the decline in the stock prices here, with that eye towards those future sales potentially dropping off. Now, Bristol Myers Squibb is also very good, though, at buying up and acquiring other companies, trying to boost, bolster the pipeline, and actually begin to overcome the challenge of the patent cliffs. Now, the trouble is they've got three essential blockbuster drugs, which are all coming off at roughly the same time, and so that could potentially leave them in the hole a little bit. So even while it looks here in orange that they've had some good earnings now, and they've got some reasonable projections for earnings growth into the future, the market is still looking out beyond that. Now, having said that, they have a handful of new drugs that they've launched in, you know, just before the pandemic. Now, those drugs are actually expected to scale up by 2025 to about $10 billion plus of sales. And, and during that time as well, we still have the Eliquis drug, which is also still going to be under patent protection, and it's still going to generate huge revenues also. And Opdevo also protected to 2028. So they've got a pipeline. They are fully aware, obviously, of the upcoming drug patent cliff. And they're defending against that by developing that pipeline. And we can sort of see the effects of some of those new drugs coming on in 2019, which are going to hopefully begin to grow and bolster the sales. So here we are within Morningstar. Now, there's a couple of key points that I really want to have a close look here. Number one, economic growth. They provided an assessment of a wide economic moat. Now, if you think about the powerful patent protections that uh, Bristol Myers Squibb has, that's probably not unsurprising. Capital allocation, exemplary. So this is also very, very promising. Now, the current assessment here is a three-star value at the present price. Now, they estimate a fair value of about $66 with a medium level of uncertainty. Uh, with the last close here at about $63. So, so basically, they see BMY at this point trading at a reasonable price. Now, 
If you look at the headline here for the analyst expectations here, they say Bristol's strong portfolio of approved and pipeline drugs is going to help mitigate the patent loss pressures. They note that they've worked with both partnerships as well as acquisitions to develop that strong portfolio in a robust pipeline. So where does that leave us then as we look at this? Well, they've got a pipeline of drugs. They've got some blockbuster drugs coming off patent soon. And one of the big questions that we need to ask is, you know, is that being reflected accurately in the current market price? According to the Morningstar estimates, that seems to be the case. And could we or should we expect more from Bristol? Let's have a look at some of those estimates and let's have a look at what might happen. First things, I, the first thing I want to have a quick look at is back to fast graphs and I want to have a look at the dividend growth. Now we can see over time there's been some lacklustre growth. There was strong growth in 2008, fairly lacklustre growth as well then to about 2019 and then some strong growth post pandemic as well. So. It's not exactly a dividend growth story, but it does pay, as we saw, a well-covered dividend that should be safe and it should be secure. So switching back to the historical chart there, there's a couple of important things that I really want to, to have a look at. So the, the expectation here from the market is this, you know, weak price relative to current and near-term earnings is reflective of the risks that we would have as an investor. We're running the risk that these earnings are going to begin to drop off as we get into the 2028, as the, the pipeline could be at risk, it may not grow as strongly as anticipated. And of course, we've got the drugs coming off the patent protection. Now, a pipeline may not grow as strongly as expected, but when the drugs come off patent protection, those sales will decline precipitously, and that's almost guaranteed. And that, I think, is why we're seeing this rather weak price performance here. Now, a couple of really important points as well. Look, it's got an A plus S&P credit rating. It is strong. It's got a 3.5% dividend yield. The dividend is well covered. The dividend is not going anywhere anytime soon, I think. Now, a couple of quick things. Let's have a quick look at these analyst estimates. So analysts find it very easy to, to evaluate and to predict what the earnings are going to be for this company. So the, the company beats analyst estimates about one third of the time, one year forward, and the two year forward estimates are beaten a quarter of the time by the company actual results. So look, this is looking good. The rest of the time, the analysts are getting it right. That's fantastic. It gives me a lot of confidence as I look forward to analyst expectations of the earnings. So I think this is where the rubber hits the road. Now, switching over to the forecasting calculators in fast graph. So there's a couple of really important things here. We've got really good analyst coverage here out to 2025 with 22 analysts providing earnings estimates for 2025. Now, we can see here on these numbers at the bottom, six months ago, three months ago, previous estimate and the current estimate there for the EPS. And we see it go down from 842 to 828 in 2024, 816 through to 812, and the end of 2023 financial year from 790 up to 8. So what this means is, hey look, analysts are busy revising those estimates up a little for the near term, down a little for the long term, but I'm not seeing strong revisions downwards that I'm seeing with many other companies and many other sectors. So that's always encouraging. Now one of the big questions is, Will prices recover to this 11.4 times price to earnings multiple? So even if we assume that 8.28 is an accurate estimate and that is the earnings at the end of 2025, our price is going to return to 11.43. The answer is I do not think so. As I said, we've got drugs coming off patent protection that is a guaranteed decline in revenue and is going to take a hit to the company's earnings. And we do have a strong pipeline here for BMY, but, 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 will they grow as quickly and as rapidly and as strongly as the company expects? And the answer is hopefully yes, but maybe. And therein, I think, lies our major risk. Now, prices did recover. So if, if by the end of 2025, we see strong growth in sales and profitability from these new drugs in the pipeline, and prices did hit 11.43 times price to earnings ratio and the earnings estimate of 8.28 is accurate, then we'd be looking at a total rate of return over this period of 55% or about 20% total annualized rate of return. That includes dividends. The reality is I don't think prices would go any lower. 
Now, if they sort of trend sideways and they sort of stay at this 8% level, eight times price to earnings level, sorry, we're looking at only about 4.5% in terms of total annualized rate of return. And, and I think this is a very, very reasonable, very, very safe, very, very conservative estimate of what we might see. I don't think prices will trend much lower. As I said, this is a strong company. They've got a very strong pipeline in development. Yes, there is some risk, but there's no evidence thus far of any catastrophic loss of sales and earnings that we might be expecting to see. And so if things trend along the way that they have, and, and maybe the new pipeline just doesn't burst and doesn't grow as quickly or as strongly as anticipated, then we might just see the price to earnings multiple sort of track along at this eight times level. In which case, yeah, I don't think we're going to lose money. But again, I don't think we're going to gain a huge amount of money either. Now, one of the other important things to note, though, is if we look back at the historical trends here, when we look at the GFC, prices took a tumble from about $30 down to 17 at the lowest, or usually about $20. So prices fell about one third. Prices fell here in the pandemic from $66 down to a low here of $48. So again, about a one third tumble in prices. So it looks like in a recession, we're not going to get a dramatic decline in the prices of BMY and, and probably not many other pharmaceutical stocks either. Yes, prices will decline, but look, people still need the drugs. People will still be buying. Health systems will still be functioning and providing drugs for people. And so I don't think we're in a situation here where you'll see a significant decline in the prices. So I think we have the opportunity here for a safe, relatively conservative investment. I don't think we're going to hit large price to earnings multiples in the near term, unless that pipeline is much stronger than anticipated. But similarly, I do not think we're going to see incredible price weakness either over this period. And I think we'll just see prices fluctuate conservatively around this eight times level uh, into the future. Presenting, yes, some opportunity there, but I don't think it's going to be a, a absolute gangbuster, massive grower, massive compounder at this point in time, at this price. Now, that's my assessment. I've taken a fairly conservative view here, given the massive reliance that BMY has on a couple of those blockbuster drugs. But let me know what you think. Hit me up in the comments below. Do you agree with this assessment? If not, why not? Do you have BMY in your portfolio? Is it something you're looking to add? Yes, we do have a very small position in our family. I will be looking at adding into BMY a little bit in the near term as well as looking to make some new pharmaceutically focused investments as well. Just trying to recession proof our portfolio in addition to the utilities and infrastructure type investments as well that I'm also eyeing up at the moment. So let me know in the comments below, is BMY on your radar today?